It is great to be with you here today. And I want to add my word of thank you to Mike Cope and the Harbor 2018 team for leading us in this challenging and bracing week as we grapple with the Holy Spirit and his transforming work in our lives. I'm grateful also for, for Pepperdine. And I know you can't really love an institution, but this institution has been so, so shaping in, in my life. I see my mom and my dad sitting over here who who met at George Pepperdine College in 1958. I, I think I can say I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this institution. And I, uh, my, my wife and I knew each other before Pepperdine, but it was at Pepperdine where we started dating and where we, where we sealed the deal. And I don't think our daughters would be here if it wasn't uh, for this university. I think about my calling to ministry and my time in Heidelberg, Germany, where, where that call became clear and how mentors and leaders in this school and associated with this school poured into me and shaped me. And so if I can say a thank you to Pepperdine University, I, I, I think that really means something. And I'm grateful to be here. And I'm, I'm thankful for Carrie. Carrie, can you pray for me every week? Uh, that, that was wonderful. So how many of you are not from around here, not from, say, Southern California? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, good. Because I, I, have, I have something to offer you here. Uh, where do you go to find your best view of Los Angeles? Where might that be? I've got some, I've got some options for you. Um, Griffith Observatory uh, is a great place to start, and there are all kinds of hiking trails that go all uh, around it, including uh, Mount Lee above the Hollywood sign. All of those lead to breathtaking views. Uh, so does Dodger Stadium, and, and above Dodger Stadium is Angel's Point, uh, which is in Elysian Park. Uh, on the west side of the city, you can go to the Getty Center that has commanding views of the City of Angels, not to mention a world-class art collection. Uh, the U.S. Bank Tower, the Sky Space as it's called, uh, now provides a 360-degree view from the 70th floor. I think it's the tallest building west of the Mississippi. It's 1,000 feet above street levels. But of course, Pepperdine University is no slouch either. It has amazing views of the South Bay looking north toward Santa Monica. I, I, I think just outside of Stafford Chapel is a pretty good place to cast your, your eyes. Uh, another great place, of course, is the Brock House, but I, I recommend you get permission from Andy and Debbie Benton uh, before you go ro uh, strolling around uh, their property. Now, why are these the best views? One word unobstructed unobstructed you're high enough that there is nothing blocking what you want to see your view goes for miles and miles and of course the opposite of unobstructed is that which blocks hinders hampers thwarts that which inhibits restricts or stymies I want you to consider with me several sports venues that will cut you a deal for an obstructed seat. Uh, this seat in Dodger Stadium wasn't even marked as an obstructed uh, seat, but you can't see third base from it. Uh, here's one at Fenway Park in, in Boston. <laughs> now, it's the perfect seat if you're my wife, Carrie, who, who goes to baseball games to chat and eat. There, there you go. That is the perfect seat uh, for you. The game doesn't have to interfere with what you're really there for. Uh, Chicago's Wrigley Field is historic. So why do you need to be able to see home plate? Uh, the new Yankee Stadium in New York City has the notorious Section 239 with an obstructed view of right field. I mean, how many plays really go to right field or first base? <laughs> and of course, even if you're able to get an unobstructed seat, there's no guarantee what the fan in front of you will choose to wear. So I think you can appreciate the difference that an unobstructed view makes. So where might we find an unobstructed view of God and the life that God calls us to live? And what can sustain us in this transformed life that that unobstructed view can give rise to? These are the questions that we're going to reflect on today as we look at 2 Corinthians 3. Thank you very much, Mike Hope. <clears throat> Allow me a brief introduction to 2 Corinthians. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul defends his ministry and his motives for, for about a five-chapter chunk, beginning in chapter 2 and going to chapter 7. And why does Paul do this? Well, apparently some, some missionary teachers have come to Corinth after Paul has been there, and they're 
belittling Paul's authority and his ministry leadership. They're saying things like, Paul's ministry is weak. His speaking is not terribly commanding. And he works for free. I mean, you know you get what you pay for, right? Of course, Paul defends tooth and nail his right to work for free. So in these five chapters, Paul asks the question, what is the nature of Christian ministry? And what does authentic Christian ministry look like? And, and in those chapters, as Paul lays that out, he also makes a powerful case that he is a faithful minister of Christ. So in 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 3, he starts with a discussion about letters of recommendation. And we're familiar with these. A number of us who are teachers or ministers write a bunch of these this time uh, of year. Letters of recommendation were widespread in the ancient world as they are in our world today. Uh, here's one you don't want to get. Dear admissions people, please let Claire be a graduate student in your program. She's pretty smart. Okay, thanks. Professor in a rush. <laughs> so a number of Christian teachers have come to Corinth with strong letters of recommendation, vouching for their credentials as preachers and teachers of the gospel. And Paul says, in effect, well, aren't those little letters cute? Uh, as the founder of the Corinthian church, Paul doesn't need a letter of recommendation or introduction. And that's, that's where he begins. He, he says, you yourselves are our letter to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. What authenticates Paul's ministry is how the ways of God and Jesus Christ and the Spirit are present among the Corinthians. They are his letters of recommendation. And then Paul taps the brake, lest anyone thinks he's taking too much credit. And he says, not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers, to be servants. The Greek word is, you know, deacons. Servants of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Paul is saying God authenticates our ministry through his spirit at work in us, not by some letters written on some page of recommendation. And that contrast between the life-giving spirit and the death-dealing letter leads Paul on an important and complex detour. Let me attempt to summarize. He begins by saying, now, if the ministry of death, chiseled in letters on stone tablets, came in glory so that the people of Israel could not gaze at Moses' face because of the glory of his face, a glory now set aside. How much more will the ministry of the Spirit come in glory? Paul is saying something astounding for a Pharisee of Pharisees and a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's saying as good as the law of Moses was, it couldn't give an unobstructed view of God. And then Paul goes and he riffs on the story of God's giving the law at Mount Sinai in Exodus 34. In this story, after Moses' encounter with God, Moses radiates God's glory so that the people couldn't look at Moses until that glory had faded away over time. And Paul admits this is a glorious moment in Israel's history. But then... He lays out a series of contrasts between what Moses brought and what Jesus has brought. Old covenant, new covenant, the letter, the spirit, death, life, the temporary, the permanent, the ministry of death, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of justification, the glory, and the greater glory. 
Now we know that Paul believed that the law is holy and that the commandment is holy and just and good. He says this in Romans 7. But the law given to Moses condemned human sin and it did not give the power to live a new kind of life. And so here Paul hints at what may very well be a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 that comes to fruition in Jesus Christ and his ministry of the new covenant. Here are these words. The days are surely coming, says Jeremiah, and says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Paul sees in Jesus the midpoint of history. Before Christ stands the era of, of Moses and with the covenant of, of the law written on tablets of, of stone and following Christ stands the era of the new covenant with God's spirit writing on tablets of human hearts. As glorious as it was, the written law could not give an unobstructed vision of God. A full on 360 degree view of God can only be had in Jesus Christ through God's life giving spirit. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a person, Jesus, is worth a thousand laws, or at least 613, which is the number that the rabbis came up with when they tried to count all the, all the laws that were given. And so Paul then comes to the crescendo moment in 2 Corinthians 3, where he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us who have turned to the Lord Jesus, I th that's inferred, I'm reading that in. All of us who have turned to the Lord Jesus with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, all of us are being transformed. Hey, that's the word we get our word metamorphosis from, you know, caterpillar to butterfly. That's, that's the word that the gospel writers use when Jesus is transfigured and his clothing is so bright that they can almost, his disciples almost can't look at him. It's, he's just dazzling. That, that's the word that Paul uses in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So he says all of us are being transformed into the same image. What image? The image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Mm. That is a mouthful for sure, but it is a tasty mouthful. Here's what's clear to me. In Christ, we get this dazzling and unobstructed view of God that helps transform us into reflections of God's image by the power of God's spirit who lives in us. As we gaze intently at God's glory, we are changed into Christ's image. Now I will admit that this text and, uh, ask more, raises more questions than I am answering or attempting to answer right now. But here's what I see as, as Paul's larger point. It is to show how authentic ministry happens when God's spirit experienced through Jesus Christ transforms those who fix their gaze on God's splendor. And that doesn't come from the letter of the law. It's God's spirit changing us from the inside out. It's God's spirit giving life where the law only gave judgment. It's God's spirit transforming us step by step on a journey from one degree of glory to another. When my youngest daughter, Michaela, was in pre-K, uh, I used to be her, her morning ride to that school three times a week. And we, we did a lot of singing together uh, in the car. And, and one of the songs that I, that I would sing with her was a song I learned in my, my youth group days that, that 
is a 2 Corinthians 3.18 kind of a song. It's just kind of a simple song, but, but it's one that gets at this idea of being changed from one degree of glory to the other. And the song went something like this. <clears throat> little by little in every day, little by little in every way, Jesus is changing me, he's changing me. Since I've made a turnabout face, I've been growing in his grace. Jesus is changing me. Some of you know that. He's changing me, my precious Savior. I'm not the same person that I used to be. Sometimes it's slow going, but there's a knowing that someday perfect I will be. That's a 2 Corinthians 3.18 song. It's changed from glory into, into glory. This, as we gaze unobstructed on the glory of God in Jesus Christ, the Spirit does His thing in us. And, and over time, it's not instant and it's not all up. But it's this journey little by little and every day, little by little and every day. And so as I chew on this, this text, I... I see here a great paradox of faith. Paul says that, that, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, right? And so the, the Spirit brings this tremendous freedom. And yet, right there in the, same, in, the, in the same context, the result of that freedom is that we are gradually transformed into Christ's image from one degree of glory to the other. So far, so good, right? Except that when we say we're being conformed, we're saying we're being conformed to the likeness of Jesus' ethical and moral character, and conformity to anything doesn't sound like freedom to me. Conformity? Come on, don't put me in a box. What, what is this? But, but in Paul's way of seeing things, there is great freedom in the life of the Holy Spirit. Christ is being formed in us. Or, or if you prefer, we are being transformed into the image so that we look like Christ. And our, trans, our transfiguration, our transformation into Christ's image begins slowly but surely to change all our relationships. We begin to walk in newness of life. We become slowly but surely new creation. Our inward self is being made new day by day. And we begin to live in this beautiful kind of life, enjoying the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people see the, the, the practice of religion in general and of Christianity in specific to, to bring with it a loss of liberties and freedoms. Paul sees that when we give ourselves fully to life in the spirit, we discover our true freedom, what God meant us to be, how we were meant and designed to live. And so God's freedom has two purposes. There is freedom from and there is freedom for. So first, we're, we're set free from sin. Sin is like the jailer, but Jesus Christ has invaded the prison house and released all who are willing to be set free. And tragically, some are still sitting in the jailhouse with the door wide open. According to Paul, we're also free from the condemnation of the law. And we're free from the terror of death, which will be the final enemy that God will destroy on that great day. Freedom is from, but freedom is also for. We are free to serve one another in love. We are free as friends of Jesus and not his servants, but his friends to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. We are free to love freely, to serve graciously, to give generously, to live without fear of judgment, to forgive without angst, to be joyful without cynicism. The Spirit grants us genuine freedom to choose a different way of life from our previous enslaved, clutching, insecure selves. So often, what may seem like a constraint can also be a means of liberation. So here's an image of Yosemite's El Capitan. It's the largest slab of granite in the world, 2,750 feet tall. Uh, for comparison, I've placed one World Trade Center in New York City next to it. Uh, side by side, El Cap would tower over one World Trade Center by 1,000 feet. And since the 1950s, climbers have climbed El Capitan using ropes and harnesses for safety. 
Now, all that changed on Saturday, June 3, 2017, when rock climber Alex Honnold completed an unbelievable feat. He is the first person ever to free solo the entire granite face of El Capitan. Now, here's what free solo means. It means no rope and no equipment whatsoever. Yes, Alex Honnold climbed the vertical face of El Capitan uh, with his bare hands and his rock climbing shoes and nothing but a bag of chalk hanging from his belt loop every now and then to just kind of dry his hands. It took him three hours and 56 minutes, faster than I can run a marathon. Nothing like it has ever been done. It's like a moonshot. It's hard to overstate the, the physical and mental difficulties of this climb. El Capitan is a vertical climb more than half a mile up, taller than the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And I don't need to tell you that when you climb without a rope, there is no margin for error. You, you miss that tiny hold as, 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 you know, as big as the grandma, your grandma's mole on her nose and, and you're going down. It's permanent. The route that Honnold took to reach the top is called Free Rider. It has 33 sections or, or pitches. It's so difficult that it's newsworthy when a climber successfully climbs it with ropes. And he did it with naught but his hands and his feet. And after he had completed the, the climb and got to the top, he was interviewed and he said, honestly, I think it's the most satisfied I've ever been. It was exactly what I hoped for. I felt so good. A year before that climb, I had the privilege of running into Alex Honnold at the top of Glacier Point at Yosemite. Uh, that was kind of a cool moment for me. But I want you to think about Alex Honnold. What seems like constraint is often a means of liberation. Alex Honnold is free to climb without ropes because he has long submitted himself to a discipline, to workouts, to climbings, to testings, to challenges. He said he felt so good after he completed it. He said, I think I could do another lap. <laughs> Whoo. <laughs> so some restrictions and disciplines are actually liberating. Have you ever seen a gifted musician playing the piano? I think of my friend Chris, who is a master of the piano. You can request a song and he'll just, he'll just start improvising on the spot and it's amazing. And you watch him play and there is a freedom and an unfettered joy as he rips off runs and effortlessly throws in little trills. And you think to yourself, man, I would love to be able to do that. And if you ask Chris, he would tell you it is the culmination of years and years and years of practice along with the musical gift that God gave to him. So there is this paradoxical relationship between freedom and, and self-limitation, between life and the spirit and submission to Christ. And the New Testament writers recognize this healthy tension in which we live. In 1 Peter 2, as servants of God, live as free people. All right, freedom! Wait, 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 finish the verse. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Galatians 5, 13. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Freedom, yes. Okay, wait, finish the verse. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. And of course, 2 Corinthians 3, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, the spirit. Augustine, the, the great influential theologian of the fourth and fifth centuries, preached a sermon once on love. And in it, he, he laid out his famous dictum. He said, once and for all, I give you this one short command. Love and do what you will. Now hold on, Augustine. You're making me nervous. But, but if you understand the freedom that the Spirit brings, then yes, love, love and do what you will. He, he goes on, if you hold your peace, hold your peace out of love. If you cry out, cry out in love. If you correct someone, correct them out of love. If you spare them, 
Spare them out of love. Let the root of love be in you. Nothing can spring from it but good. I believe Augustine is summing up what Jesus said is the most important thing in all of Scripture. You want to know what it is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to give Charles Wesley the last word here today. And I haven't gotten into the debates about, you know, can you become spiritually perfect in this lifetime? I, I don't think so. But I, I don't care about the, the perfection. The, the call is higher up. The call is more like Jesus. And I intend to become more like Jesus over my lifetime by the power of the Holy Spirit from glory to glory. And so... Charles Wesley, his great hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. It's a 2 Corinthians 3.18 kind of a verse. It's a prayer. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. And then here's the line, changed from glory to glory. Changed from glory into glory. Till with thee we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Amen.